My brothers and sisters in Christ, if a little child was to come and ask you, Mama, Papa, what is mystery? Is it something important? What would you answer then? Please take a moment to think of your response. To be honest, I wouldn't like to be put in a position where I had to answer that on the spur of the moment. Mystery has to do with relating to realities that we cannot comprehend or understand fully. Fully is the important word here. When we hear of a mystery, our first reaction can be, well, I cannot understand it, I must accept it. And we respond in that way in good faith. However, it would be better to think of a mystery as something that we have to try to understand. And the more we come to understand it, the more we realize there is to understand. As we reflect on the Eucharist now, let us be aware that we are dealing with mystery. Indeed, several mysteries. God's love for us, the cross, the resurrection, the way in which we may experience the presence of Christ in the world today, the church, all these mysteries touch on the mystery of the Eucharist. So we are really in the realm of mystery. And with the help of our Blessed Mother, may we be open to ponder these mysteries, especially the mystery of the Eucharist, rather than to be expecting clear descriptions or answers to our questions. Just to digress for a moment, the word mystery is also used in different senses. In the liturgy and sometimes in the letters of St. Paul, the word mystery is used to mean more of what we would call sacrament. So, for example, after the consecration, when the priest says, the mystery of faith, as I understand it, what could be said is the sacrament of faith. Anyway, that's just a, a, a little digression. That's so that we can, I hope that that's the way I understand it and I hope. I hope that makes it perhaps a little bit clearer for, for some. But before we can understand the Eucharist in any depth, we need to come to terms with the notion of thanksgiving. Because the word Eucharist, as I'm sure you know, means thanksgiving. It may sound a little bold, but, my brothers and sisters, what are we giving thanks for? Am I giving thanks that I arrived safely in, in Singapore and that the plane didn't crash? <laughs> oh, yes. Are you giving thanks that your son got the place that he was wanting at university? That you were not caught by the police for speeding? That you had more money in your account than you expected when you saw your bank statement and found that a debtor who owed you for a long time had finally paid. Yes, all these events in our lives, our events in our lives, when, when we live in faith, invite us to acknowledge the Lord and His goodness to us. And it is certainly right that we do thank God now for the big but. What are we really giving thanks for is the unfathomable, faithful love of God for us. That is what we are giving thanks for. Let us put God's love in this way. We do not have the freedom or the power 
to influence God's love for us. No matter what we do or fail to do, no matter how grievously we sin, God's love for us is constant and faithful. We cannot understand it because basically we cannot love in the same way. We can only believe it. Though I admit that there are some people who are given the ability to love in a heroic way and sometimes very ordinary people. And although the Lord tells us to love one another as He has loved us, could any of us say that we have loved as the Lord loves us? It is the same as when He says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Basically, when the Lord instructs us in this way, He's teaching us that we must never be satisfied with ourselves, never satisfied. That our love or our life is what it should be. What is important is that we recognize that God's love is a matter of faith, of believing. It is not so much knowing, even less is it feeling. More than anything, it is believing. And let us remember that we are looking at what we are giving thanks for. And I would like to read you a true story that Father John Fullenbach quotes uh, in one of his books, which is a wonderful parable of uh, the, the, I think, of, of the love of God. And um, please allow me to share with you, it may take a little bit longer, but... I, I, I think it's, it's worth it. Let me tell you, this is what he's saying. And I, I could tell you the story, but if I do, I'll, I'll miss something out. And it's very well written. So, so excuse me if, if I really read it. Let me tell you about a teenager whom we will call Tom. Getting on the train, he was very nervous and excited. And you will soon see why. He sat opposite a middle-aged man that he had never met before. But he felt that he should tell him his story. He told him that he had just been released from reformatory school, where he had spent three years for robbery and other crimes. He realized how wrong he had been. And he just wanted a second chance to go straight and to show that he was sorry. He felt so sorry for letting his family down. And he hoped that they would forgive him. They had never visited him or written to him during the three years. But he did realize that neither of his parents could write and that they were too poor to be able to come to the reformatory, which was a long distance from their home. He wanted so much to be able to go home, but he wanted to make sure that he was welcome. He wrote to his parents and asked them to give him a sign. His home was just beside the railway track. And they had an old apple tree at the end of the garden. If they wanted him back, all they had to do was to put a white ribbon on the apple tree. If he was not welcome home, they were put to put nothing on the tree and he would just pass on to some town where he knew nobody and no one knew him. As the, as the train 
who was close to home, he was nervous and he could not look. And he asked his newfound friend to look for him. After a while, the man caught Tom by, by the shoulder with joy on his face and he said, just take a look. Tom looked and saw the old apple tree and it was wearing not just one white ribbon but a whole host of ribbons. Tears ran down Tom's face and the bitterness and anger of the years washed away. The other man said later, I felt that I had witnessed a miracle. Think about the story and analyze it. Let it be enough for me to say that Tom stands for the sinner that is each one of us. His traveling companion represents those who support us along the journey of life. Tom's parents represent God. But can't we say that Tom started off by believing in some way in his parents' love? Next, my good friends, we need to ask ourselves what God's love has done for us. It has saved us. Mysteriously, God did not wave a magic wand sitting in his armchair to save us. No, he gave his only son. And it's not so much us, but it's only you who are parents. Perhaps you have one child, an only child, can understand something of what the evangelist and what God did in giving Christ to the world. God gave His only Son. Christ was rejected and tortured to death so that we may not die but have eternal life. In the second reading of the Mass for this coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, <coughs> we will hear one of the most amazing verses of Scripture where St. Paul tells us, God made the sinless one into sin. Out of love, the Son of God shared the depth of our wretchedness. Ultimately, we can say that God Himself shared our suffering and death. There can be no greater and more convincing sign of His love for us than becoming one with us in our weakness and in our wretchedness. But as we know, it does not end there. He rises from the dead and returns to those who had abandoned Him. And without asking any questions or demanding an apology, He says, Peace be with you. Going into too much explanation, are not we the ones who have abandoned Him? We are the ones to whom he offers his peace unconditionally. My brothers and sisters in Christ, basically this is what we give God thanks and praise for. Through his death and resurrection, we have the promise of eternal life. This is what the Eucharist is about. 
Today, when I reflect on it, it lifts me up. And in fact, all of us can rise to a higher plane as we believe it and we allow it to sink into the depths of our being. This is wonderful. And I use the word deliberately. It is a source of great wonder. So good. But we cannot really grasp it. Mysterious. It is also challenging because life is not always a smooth ride. What happens to our thanks when the father of a young family as a breadwinner is diagnosed with terminal cancer and he is a member of one's own family? What happens to thanks when a wife finds out that her husband has been unfaithful? What happens to thanks when one is deeply hurt, wounded, betrayed by another person, especially someone one trusted? Even when one has to face the normal pressures of day-to-day -day life, week after week and month after month, our desire and our sense of the need to give thanks and the uh, it can evaporate. And yet, at every Mass, as we enter the most solemn part, the priest says, it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. Sometimes the words may vary slightly, but the meaning is always the same, no matter what the circumstances. We are to give God thanks and praise. How can this thanksgiving be real and come from any depth when we are suffering? And again I say, as I am aware of my own weakness, this can be a real challenge. Of course, it cannot be thanksgiving in the head, while my heart is heavy and burdened. That is not thanksgiving. We can all say, oh God I thank you, oh God I praise you, telling God how great he is, and telling him all about himself as though he needs to hear it from us. Although it can be a profession of faith, I know. And perhaps we can even go to prayer meetings. But all the while, we are escaping the reality of our situation and drugging ourselves with what we think may be thanksgiving. And not really giving a deep thanks to God at all. The challenge is not to escape but to be thankful with all that we are, thankful in the very depth of our being, in the midst of our sufferings and trials. And that can only happen when we forget ourselves radically and move beyond ourselves. There is one verse in scripture from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which we heard this evening, that helps me to do this. And that is where he says, and unfortunately the, the translation that we have at Mass is, well, I, I'm, I don't know Greek, I wish I did, but uh, I, it doesn't seem to come through clearly to me what I understand. And that is when St. Paul says, so we didn't hear these exact words in the reading, but this is what he says. St. Paul says, everything works for good with those who love God. Everything works for good. Everything means that there is nothing that the Lord will not turn to our good because He is almighty. He has the power. And as we said earlier, His love is beyond anything that we can imagine. 
my brothers and sisters in Christ, is this not what real faith is about? Having a depth of thanksgiving in the midst of our trials and sufferings. This also explains why spiritual writers and theologians say that the Eucharist is the highest expression of our faith. When we go to Mass, we transcend, we move beyond ourselves so that we and our, sac and, and, and our situation can be spiritually transformed. When our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Eucharist at the Last Supper, He was doing exactly that Himself, wasn't He? You know as well as I do, he took bread and gave thanks and said, this is my body. Again he gave thanks, taking the cup and saying, this is my blood shed for you. Simply from a human point of view, the Lord knew very well what was awaiting him that night and the next day. But from the depth of his being, he could still give thanks. Why? Because he believed that his suffering and death would be transformed into a new and abundant life for him and for the whole of creation. The church calls us to give thanks like that every Sunday. On account of our human weakness, we can so easily forget to give thanks, to believe that the Lord is, and again mysteriously, at work in all that He permits to happen to us, and that everything is in the process of being turned to good. It's so easy to, to forget that. I do. This is one of the reasons it is important that we uh, participate uh, and are attentive at Mass every Sunday. Our lives can be and will be transformed through Thanksgiving. And another reason for going to Mass every Sunday is related to this, and that is as an expression of our desire to love God faithfully in return for his faithful love and as I said his love for us is constant one of the ways in which we can show that we want to live as faithful disciples is by faithfully <coughs> participating and being attentive at the mass every Sunday and that means even when it's not convenient Unless, of course, there is some serious reason. Making Sunday Mass the centre of our lives, our priority, may demand sacrifices, but in the end, we will be strengthened through Christ, through our thanksgiving, in a way that goes far deeper than feelings or anything that we are able to sense. And again, I haven't explained it, but, uh, but it is implied that it is Christ Himself who is our thanksgiving. We eat His living body and drink His blood to become one with Him in thanksgiving, no matter what life is presented to us. And this is so positive if we really think of it. When we receive the, very, the valuable gift from somebody, do we not often think to ourselves, well, how can I thank him or her? It is as though saying thank you is not enough. And we do not know uh, what to do to show our thanks. When we are deeply aware of all that the Lord is doing for us, even our individual personal union with Christ 
that giving thanks is not enough. It's not adequate. We need to give thanks with others. And there is the point of the Mass again. To put it rather crudely, if one person pushes a car, it will not go very quickly. But get a group of people uh, to push it. They may even manage to push it part way up a hill. We need to give thanks with others if it is to have any strength, any real meaning. In fact, to give thanks with Christ and in Christ is giving thanks with and in the church, which is His body. It is not just me and Christ, the pair of us, giving thanks together even. No, but it is all of us as the body of Christ doing it together in the same spirit. In my experience, the greatest sense that I have had of this is when we celebrate the Easter Vigil together. And I suppose that is the way it should be. And yet, there should be an atmosphere at every Mass. And the way that we can contribute to that is by transcending ourselves in giving thanks and being aware that, that we are all doing it together in and with our Lord Jesus Christ. God will His presence. You know, I haven't come across any clear reference that St. Bernadette made to thanksgiving or prayers to God. But when we look at her whole life, we see a remarkably humble person. Although she accused herself of pride. And that just tells us that she was not proud of her humility. She knew she was not perfect and was in debt to God. Humility and thanksgiving go together. Because unless we are totally self-absorbed, we feel in debt to those who have been good to us. St. Bernadette gives us a wonderful example of reverence and appreciation for the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And she saw it as a source of strength. And I will speak more about that on Saturday evening. When we turn to the Lord in true thanksgiving, we are strengthened. We must remember that she was living in a different time and so the aspect of the mystery of the Eucharist that she would have emphasized and lived has changed. Led by the Holy Spirit, the church is placing more importance on the community aspect of the sacrament. In line with St. Paul's teaching. And for 140 years, the sanctuary in Lourdes has witnessed to this community aspect in the Blessed Sacrament procession, when sick people, able-bodied people, priests, lay people, all together walk in procession with the Lord present in the Blessed Sacrament. It's a wonderful expression of community, of our journeying together through life. But what our reason why I'm mentioning it is because you have a sense of community, of being together in that. And that is so important when we come to Mass, to be aware that we are not just coming alone, but we are coming to be together. When we come to Mass, to the Lord in the Eucharist, to give Him thanks for His loving gift of salvation, and to actually celebrate our salvation, it is so important that we are aware that we are with others. And that we have love for them in our hearts, even when it is difficult. And in the same vein, let us think of what we are doing when we offer each other the sign of peace at Mass. You know, the priest can say, let us offer each other, or the deacon can say, let us offer each other the sign of peace. And what do we do? We turn and we wish each other peace. But what is in our minds? What is in our hearts? It's so easy just to become a ritual. No, my sisters and brothers, let us try not to do that. Let us 
wish, specifically wish the person that we're looking at, the person that is before us, let us specifically wish them the peace of the Lord. This giving of ourselves in wishing each other peace too is far more important than any external ritual. What is in our hearts as we, as we celebrate Mass and as we wish peace to others is far more important than the actions and the ritual of the Mass. Anyway, we could talk a long time about that too, but I won't. I'm, I'm coming to an end now. <laughs> Yes, the Eucharist is about offering ourselves to the good Lord in a spirit of thanksgiving for His love, which is without end. We cannot separate the giving of ourselves to the Lord and giving of ourselves to others. It is all one reality, held together by the mystery of the Eucharist.